Okay, so welcome to the second webinar in the Livestock Webinar Series on Getting Started Selling Local Meats. Um, we're excited that you're here with us tonight. We have an excellent guest speaker that's gonna come on in just a moment. Um, again, if you can take a minute to uh, check out that poll and uh, answer that quick question. And we're gonna get started here in just a minute. As a reminder, this is gonna be recorded and um, it will be made available after uh, the webinar ends, either tonight or tomorrow, it will be emailed out to you along with some handouts or some links that are mentioned in tonight's webinar, um, as well as an evaluation. So if you'll take a few minutes to complete that evaluation, I would greatly appreciate it. So let me introduce our guest speaker tonight, Lee Minas. Uh, with the NC Choices program. Lee has worked with the NC Choices program at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems at NC State University since 2007, uh, providing marketing, regulatory, and technical support to farmers and processors working with pasture raised, pasture raised meats in North Carolina. NC Choices hosts the biannual Carolina Meat Conference, which is one of the largest gatherings of farmers, processors, extension agents, and others in the pasture-raised meats industry on the East Coast. In addition to his work at NC Choices, he has been involved in raising and direct marketing pasture-raised Berkshire hogs, beef, lamb, and poultry on his family farm in China Grove, North Carolina since 2002. So without further ado, I am going to stop screen sharing and let Lee get on and start teaching. All right, it's all you, Lee. Good evening, everybody. So thank y'all for joining us, uh, taking time out of your evening to, to join us. I see my neighbors on there. Um, anyway, so uh, it looks like from the polls that the majority of you are relatively new to selling meat or exploring the idea. Um, and so, you know, what we're going to hopefully accomplish with this presentation tonight is to give you an uh, overview of what, what takes place and what you need to be thinking about when you're going to get into selling direct meats um, in North Carolina. Now, I noted from the sign up, we had some people that were out of state. So I'm going to preface this with this presentation is geared towards um, North Carolina, and that is where I'm my expertise tends to end at the uh, at the state line so if you're exploring this and you're in another state uh, theoretically the premises everything should be very similar but make sure you check that out with your local uh, or state regulatory agency department of agriculture uh, there the usda stuff i talk about will be applicable throughout the uh, United States and not just in North Carolina. But we will be talking about a few different things that happen in North Carolina. And so, like I said, if you're in, out of state, you might want to take that with a grain of salt until you double check it with, with your folks. Hey, Lee, I got something real quick. Sure. Um, can you see the polls? Can you see the results or can I only see that? Um, I had them up, but I had to I had to close them up. It looked like we were about seventy six percent new farmers. Whenever uh, okay, good, yeah. Whenever I whenever I exit out. Okay, I just want to make sure you could see it. And I also before I forget, folks, if you've got questions, please put them in the chat window. Um, I'm going to be monitoring the chat window, and uh, we'll probably save most questions for the end. But if it's something that needs to be addressed. To Lee immediately, I will notify him. Yeah, yeah. So any questions, just direct them straight to the chat, and then I'll, I'll have Lauren Lauren Ryan shotgun on those. So can everybody see my NC Choices presentation screen up? I guess I should have started with that. Um, is it coming through, Lauren, on the screen share? Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. So I, I work for NC Choices. Uh, as Lauren said, NC Choices is a, a program of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Uh, it's been in existence since about 2000. And over those years, we've, we've evolved from more of a marketing program and helping farmers learn to direct market meats to working a lot with regula regulatory authorities as well as farmers and processors throughout North Carolina and helping them navigate 
the environment and the regulatory environment and and work to uh, overcome different obstacles. You know, we've, we've worked to, to help build capacity within our processors and, and offer, um, help them offer greater value added products as well as expand marketing knowledge and uh, to farmers. And we focus on niche meats, which is, you know, pasture raised local meat um, is our sector. We don't work in, we work with confinement stuff slightly, but not a whole lot. Um, so our focus is on the niche and pasture raised meats. So is, if you're looking to, to get into it, as like I said, we're, we'll kind of focus on a pretty generic broad sense, but I want to give you an idea of, of start, if you're starting to explore this as a potential business opportunity, the things that you need to think about and the things that you need to, to that may not uh, occur to you naturally. Um, we've been doing this for, since actually been direct marketing since 1998, uh, meets here at our farm. Um, and so a lot of this, I try to base on things that I wish I'd known when I got started. But the first thing is if you're exploring this, you probably want to look at it and try to decide on what is your production going to be. And by that, I mean, here are a few questions to think about, you know, what's your advantage? What, what do you have working in your favor? What resources do you have that you can ex exploit to make profit? That's what farming's about. So what, what can you do? What can you do well? And uh, to appeal to your customers, you know, and thinking about what species you want to do. Now, for those of y'all that are in it and have been in it for a few years, you've probably answered a few of these questions already, but, if you're exploring it, you know, you may, you may be at the, at the, the point that you're looking to explore meat sales as a way to add value to an existing operation, such as a cattle herd, or if you're brand new to it, you may be starting from scratch and trying to figure out what, what your farm is capable of and what direction you want to go from uh, with no, nothing predetermined. But once you determine what your species or species is that you're going to do and then you got to focus on what kind of production you know are you going to go with a niche like grass-fed organic or grain fed and this is one of those areas that a lot of people over the years that i've worked with you know we get into it and we want to do only grass-fed angus beef that's harvested on a full moon in the middle of july or september those are the only two and the more you focus in and try to, to work yourself into a, a niche, so to speak, you can actually limit your potential down the road um, if, if things don't work out. So if you get in it and you're like, I'm going to do all organic and I'm going to do all uh, grass fed and it's, it's going to be organic and grass fed and that's just what I'm going to do, you know, and then you work out and your, your market doesn't support that price point that you need. Uh, then you may have painted yourself into a corner. So always be, when you're thinking about your production systems, be aware of that. You, you want to be defined, but you, you want to be, allow yourself some flexibility and, and not get painted into that, you know, harvesting on a full moon on a July evening. Um, you got to think about what's your capacity. This can help decide what your market, which market approach you take. And by capacity, I'm talking about how much can you do in a year? How much can you physically do on your farm with the help that you have, if it's just going to be you and your family, or do you have a, a larger farm with several employees you can tap into? Also the acreage of your farm, you know, what, how much physical acreage do you have and what's the carrying capacity of that? How many animals um, can you turn in a year's time? And so that's something to consider when you're looking at the market. One of the greatest bottlenecks, and for those that are in it at the moment, probably realize is what are your processing options? Um, when we started in direct selling meat in 98, um, we were using custom exempt processors because that was about all there was. In 2003, when we started going to the farmer's markets, there were about three places that would uh, vacuum pack and put a private label so that you could turn around and resell an inspected product that had your label on it. Now we're up to eight or nine options, possibly more, um, that can do that product for you. 
but those are still even with eight or nine of the, with a hundred counties that means that those guys are serving you know somewhere between 10 and 20 counties each or more and so you need to think about what's close by are you able to even get into them right now um i was actually on the um, texting back and forth with my processor today in the 10 years that I've worked with them, I've never had more than about a two week lead time to give them to get in. And I just booked the rest of my processing dates for the rest of the year. Um, they're currently booking in August. Like I said, they, it's, they've been the worst I've ever, most I've ever had to wait was two to three weeks. And that was usually at Christmas during the Christmas rush. And now they're booked up for three or four months ahead of time. So, Processing has recently in the last three or four weeks become another bottleneck again, but you need to really explore and figure out what those processing options are because some of those processors aren't even taking new, new clients at this time. Um, so there's a, uh, so as you sit down and, and you are trying to figure out where to start, best thing is to make a plan, but overall you've got to know your cost. Um, when you think about, think about your breeds, what genetics do you have? What kind of feeds do you plan to feed? Uh, what's your processing options? What's your marketing going to be like? And what's the price point that your market is support? And we'll go into each one of these in just a little bit more detail. And then what, what's that volume? And that's going to tie back into that marketing. So when you're talking about breeds, like I said, you know, figure out what breeds suit what you want to do. You want to match the genetics to your production and your market marketing. Um, and, and one thing to remember is there could be a lot of variation within breeds. Take the Angus breed, cattle breed, for example. If anybody's been involved in Angus, you probably realize that there are Angus bloodlines that make these big framey seven, seven frame cattle. And then there's right from a farm down the road can be a purebred Angus that's coming in at these really small number four frames um, that are going to do be a much different animal altogether from those bigger ones. But what you want to do is take and try to figure out what genetics do you need to match your production and your marketing. So I'm going to pick, I'll pick on a few breeds here and there and y'all take it with a grain of salt. Hopefully I don't hurt nobody's feelings, but you know, if your goal is to produce a hundred percent grass fed beef with a choice um, marbling to it, you're probably not going to do it with a limousine. Limousines are big framey, really known for their lean genetics. Um, you know, if you're, if that's your market, then you probably want to focus on what can I, what breeds do I need? I need those smaller framed genetic cattle that will have a, they put on muscle easy, easier than those big lean breeds and therefore will marble easier with less calories. On the other hand, if you're already starting and say you have a, a Charlotte herd, then you probably want to match your production to your genetics and say, all right, well, if I'm going to produce a, a well marbled beef, then it's probably going to have to have some grain to go with it. So, you know, those are considerations to take into to account. So whether you're starting with a, a breed to begin with or you're starting from scratch and trying to decide your breed, think about your, your production and, and what you want to do that. And those are going to open up different markets. You know, you may be in a position that you can take, take advantage and get a premium for, for a grass-fed beef. Or you may, maybe your market, local market saturated and, and there's a, a place for people to pay a premium for a really good prime finish corn fed local beef. But whatever you decide, you do need to think about where are you going to get your animals uh, or your breeding stock and are they readily available? And this is one of the things a lot of the producers I've run into over the years with pigs get hung up. Um, a lot of people get into it. They're like, I'll raise six or seven pigs and they get some pigs and it works out really well. And then they're like, well, I'm going to get 20 pigs this time. And so they go back to the same person they got those from and they get five pigs from them. They get five pigs from somebody down the road and then they get five pigs from somebody else. They go on Craigslist and they get some $20 feeder pigs. And so within that range of four or five different producers, 
you know, that those animals are going to may have a wide variety of, of cap genetic capability. One of the things uh, for us, we do Berkshire's on pastures, and that was one of the deciding factors in us is in going into a, uh, a full farrow to finish operation was so that we would have control. We could get the genetics we want. We would know what they were capable of. We would know they were cons with consistent genetics. You can consistently plan on when your animals will be ready. Um, whereas you don't know whether with that $20 feeder pig, is it going to be uh, 250 pounds in six months or is it going to take it a year and a half to get there? Um, but as you're thinking about this and you're thinking about the numbers you're going to raise and the breeds you're going to get, where are you going to get those and are they readily available and are they read readily available when you need them? Are they going to be there year round or is it a seasonal thing? And what's the cost of that going to be? Like I said, you know, feeder pigs this time of year, uh, I know people that are selling them for $125. And then I, like I said, you can go on Craigslist and find them for 20 or $30. Um, but there's a world of difference. And sometimes a hundred dollar pig is a better investment than buying two pigs or five pigs at $20. Uh, you like to make a better return because they'll grow off and finish out better and give you a better product in the end. Another place is when you get into chow time and thinking about your feed sources and what are you gonna do? What's gonna be on the menu for your production? You know, if you're grass fed, one thing you think to keep in consideration is just because it's green doesn't mean it's grass, you know, quality forage. Um, you've got to think about it. if you're doing grass fed, you need to, to really seriously look at your pastures and say, figure out, do you have the quality of pasture to, to pull this off? So just as important as the genetics are to, to make a successful grass fed beef product, you've got to look at your pasture and see that you have the quality of pasture there because what you're effectively doing is I, I like to make the comparison sometimes when we're talking about uh, genetics and feeding on pasture it's kind of like um, feeding trying to take a those big frame cattle trying to like take a, a linebacker high school linebacker and get him keep him in football shape for off of the salad bar well he's not going to do it just off of iceberg lettuce alone you know, he's got to have something with some calories on the menu to get him to that state. And it's kind of the same thing with your grass. You know, you can have iceberg lettuce or you could have a really good nutrient dense micro uh, green. So, you know, you think about that pasture quality if you're going for a grass fed product. And grain fed, where will you get the feed? You know, uh, there are a lot of local, small local feed mills and, and local towns that can do that for you. Uh, you need to look at them and talk to them and see what they have available. Uh, what do what do they charge? Do they have minimums? Are they do they want to do five tons at a time of feed for you? Or will they do out five hundred pounds of feed? So that's something to consider. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, another thing is, you know, that meat quality affects uh, affects from the feed. And that's something you really need to think about. Um, uh, also on some pasture pig groups on Facebook and stuff, and somebody was posted the other day, and they, they wanted to get into raising pigs, and they were going to feed it off of table scraps and shelled corn. And so you need to think about what your feed program is going to do. Uh, especially with pigs, you have something that grows really fast. It's able to utilize a lot of different um, sources of nutrition. Um, but it's what that nutritional composition of that feed is will affect how fast those animals grow how, and how fast they grow can affect the meat quality. Um, if you don't push those animals along and they don't get enough nutrients, they can start going backwards and they'll lose fat. They lose fat first and that's going to affect your meat quality. So if you have a, a calf that you're finishing, a, a grass-fed beef, and you're finishing him, you get through the spring, and you've got him good and fat, and then you try to hold him through the summer, and it turns dry, and he's eat, out there munching on uh, brown grass, first thing he's going to lose is uh, fat and that marbling that he's put in. That's going to be the first thing he utilizes when his uh, feed, feed is less than what he needs to, to keep moving forward. 
but also uh, uh, there's there's fat versus lean effects of feed pigs this is real pronounced um, see a lot of people that try to feed just shell corn um, carbs equal fat so if you want to put fat on a pig feed them carbs uh, if you want lean go heavier on the protein so what you want to do is is find that nice balanced feed that that unlocks that gen and if you got the right genetics it can unlock that genetic potential because what you don't want is a really fat you don't want to get a pork chop back and it's four inches of fat and the eye of the pork chop's only two inches around because all you did was feed it shell corn um all flavors can be absorbed everybody's heard the story of uh the Somebody killed a cow and it had been out on spring pasture and it tastes like wild onions. And that's those uh, lipids and the flavors and those, this going into fat transfer and getting in the fats and the meats. And so those can be pretty pronounced. If you're doing uh, pigs, acorns and peanuts are a popular thing that people like to try. Uh, one of the things about them is be aware that some feeds like acorns and peanuts have a uh, unsaturated fats or high in oil and they will actually affect the um, composition of the fat and so it can be prized for the peanut or the acorn finished pork is prized for curing country hams but when it comes to making sausage it's not worth a hoot because that fat is actually doesn't get hard like a white fat that comes from feeding the, the carbs from corn um, that lipid carries through and it won't set up and while that can be attractive and add a really nice flavor to a country ham or something that's going to, to be cured over a long period of time when you put it in fat what it makes is for a greasy sausage patty that your customers are not going to like um, if you're raising pigs also castration is an important point uh, boar taint can be an issue uh, if you read the studies on it it can be hit or miss it can different breeds are more prone to it as well as different blow lines within those breeds um, but it is a real thing and what happens is uncastrated male produces a very musky flavor that comes out through the fat when it's when heat's applied to it so when you cook pork chop can smell fine when you take it out of the package and when you lay it in the pan it's going to stink up your whole house and if anybody that's ever experienced boar tank knows that's not a pleasant thing to get out of your house. Um, and always remember when it comes to your meat quality, your customer is directly going to decide on their future purchases based on taste. If they love it, if it's the best thing they put in their mouth, then they're going to be back for more. If, if it has boar tank, I don't care if they've been customers for five years, chances of them coming back are going to be, um, uh, greatly reduced and so now that we've, we've got that we're going to hit the cliff notes of processing and processing is a pretty pretty big umbrella of issues um, but just of it is all red meat must be slaughtered under inspection if it's offered for sale and the two levels of inspection are in usda and ncda for slaughtering that's here in north carolina some states I've talked to, uh, their Department of Ag can oversee slaughter certain situations like ours. Um, <clears throat> and then some, some states have only USDA <coughs> meat inspection. But uh, if it is offered for sale, it must be slaughtered. Now you can, if you're, if you're doing it for yourself, you can slaughter at home or on your farm. You can you're welcome to kill a cow and, and butcher it. You just cannot sell it. You can give it away to friends. You can give it away to family. But that if um if it is bartered or sold, um, it's you you get into the area of breaking the law. Uh, in North Carolina, if you're going to handle meat after the process or finishes it up, so you take a cow to the processor. They do the processing at which point you pick up the meat and you either deliver it to a customer or you take it to a farmer's market. You are required to register with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture for a meat handler's license. This is a free service and they, um, you just call the number, you tell them what you, you want, and they're gonna come out and check you and they'll check in on you once a year, make sure you have a dedicated um, place for storage 
of your meats for sale. This is a USDA um, inspection seal. If you notice, you'll find this on all meat products that have gone through the USDA inspection process. Um, carcasses, if, if they're are stamped with this on them, uh, packages will contain it on, um, on the label. And this, this allows to, to show that the product was done in inspected facility and the uh, establishment number there on the bottom traces it back to the plant that was done. So if there's ever an issue, um, they have trace back. This uh, trapezoid is the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's version of that. And the P number is the plant number, so this would be plant uh, number seven. Now the difference between these two is the USDA logo, anything, anything that goes to the USDA inspection is uh, able to be sold across state lines. So it can be processed in North Carolina, you can take it to South Carolina, set up a farmer's market, you can take it to South Carolina, you can sell it to somebody who can then take it to Georgia and set up at a farmer's market, it can cross state lines, it can be um, sold, sold till it gets to the consumer end. If it has an NCDA inspection, it is only eligible to be sold within the boundaries of North Carolina. So if you're in an area of like Charlotte, um, you couldn't go set up even, you couldn't even technically meet a customer and exchange product in the uh, Cabela's parking lot right across the, the line in South Carolina. Um, so it must be sold within the state of North Carolina. Um, back to the meat handler's license, it's free. You just register by calling NCDA. Um, and what they're gonna be looking at is that you have proper transport. Uh, and proper transport means that they do not have a clear definition as to whether you need freezers or coolers or what. What, what they expect is that if you are transporting frozen product, product, you're doing it in a manner that it maintains a frozen state. If you're transporting fresh, then it needs to maintain a temperature of 41 degrees or less. Uh, and that can be done in a cooler. It can be done technically if it's in the, a crate, uh, cardboard box in the back of your truck in the middle of January and it's 20 degrees out, as long as it's not exposed to the elements and it is, is covered and sealed, you're in good shape and it doesn't change for them. Um, dedicated storage, they're gonna come out and they're gonna come out yearly and check, but you have to have a dedicated freezer space or storage space for your product. That means that only meat product, inspected meat products are here. So it can't be the chest freezer in your garage. It also has your chicken pot pies in it and your strawberries from last, or last spring. It has to be only inspected meat. Now it can be inspected meat for home use, but it still has to be inspected unadulterated meat. And it all, all, all those products have to contain the inspected le legends and you'll get those in annual visits by NCDA. And they're just gonna randomly pop by and just make sure you don't have any chicken pot pies and they're hanging out with them and that you're not you know, selling anything that doesn't uh, qualify. Um, poultry exemption. Now, if you notice, it said red meat requires, um, all red meat requires slaughter under inspection. Um, North Carolina participates in the federal poultry exemption. Um, USDA does oversee poultry slaughter and, and packaging which will also contain the, the round inspected seal. Under the poultry exemption, this varies from state to state as to whether your state uh, participates in it. Uh, North Carolina used to participate only up to 1,000 birds until about 2008. Then they accepted the full federal exemption, which allows you to do up to 20,000 birds per year on your farm of your own raising. You cannot buy 20,000 thousand birds from your neighbor and process them on your farm under this exemption. Technically they have to be birds of your raising. So if you buy them, buy them a week ahead of time, and keep them for a week and you've raised them. Um, you must register with NCDA. It's very similar to the meat handler's license. You call them up, you say I want to operate under the poultry exemption and I'm going to process my own birds. 
and very similarly, probably the same person will come and they're going to go over with you and make sure that your certain records are kept. Um, pull all this up. Um, one of the things you've got to do is you've got to keep records of how many birds you killed, um, when you killed them, where they're sold. Uh, nothing, it's not like you've got to say, I sold Lauren Langley five birds this weekend at eight o'clock in the morning at the farmer's market, but you do need to keep a record of, I sold 20 birds at this farmer's market on this Saturday morning. And then I sold, you know, 20 birds to a customer that, three customers that came by that evening and picked them up at the farm. Uh, so they do expect uh, a record keeping there and they probably want to see, make sure that it matches up to the um, processing records you have. Now the exemption, the exception to that is that is only for the birds that are processed on your farm that you have to keep those records. If you have birds that you get processed in an inspected plant, um, you do not have to keep all these records. Um, if you're doing the inspection on your farm, they're going to come out, they're going to look at your processing facilities and make sure, you know, that you can do it in a safe, clean manner. Basically what they want to see is that your equipment's in good repair. You're not cutting them on an old piece of plywood. You know, you've got a nice stainless steel table that's not rusted up. Uh, you know, they prefer to, to see that you've got some sort of roof over top of you to, to keep the um, dust and rain or anything like that out. Um, now what happened was up until 2017, we had, uh, had had as many as three, I guess two, two operating at any point in time in the 20 some years I've been doing it. We've had three separate places operate under as USDA inspected facilities that would do processing for other commercial uh, producers for to do it for resale and provide you with a farm lo a label with your farm name on it and an inspected product. Um, over those 20 years, those three places have all came and went and have disappeared and gone out of business. Uh, one of the things is due to a whole, well, this whole list of reasons, but when it comes to uh, poultry processing, it's just a really hard business to make unless you have, or like Tyson and can have the birds to run that facility, you know, at least two shifts a day, 52 weeks a year. Um, and with seasonality of pasture poultry just makes it very hard for these uh, for-profit operations to, to work. So in 2017, uh, when Foothills Pilot Plant, which was the last one to be open, closed down unexpectedly right uh, about the second week of October, right before everybody that had their turkeys scheduled, um, we scrambled. And NCDA issued a statewide processing exemption because, because of the closure and the lack of federal inspected options. Um, this basically said that the farms that were doing on-farm processing could apply for a temporary permit to do processing for others, and they could charge as though they were a processing business. The, the birds that they did still had to be of the producers raising that they contract with. Uh, they still bear the, the same labeling. They still must be sold and rec records kept and everything just as though they were done on the farm. But this has allowed several farms to um, offer to offer uh, processing to other farms. And this has been extended every year since 2018. And this has to be renewed every year by the acting director or the director of meat and poultry. So far it's continued. It looks like it will continue into the, the future. But if you're looking for somebody to process, we have a list of those processors at ncchoices.com. And these birds can be sold off site and wholesale. The, processed under the exemption. So you could process them under the exemption, sell them to a grocery store or uh, another entity like that that can sell them. All right, so now we've kind of covered the processing. So thinking about marketing, think about where you're gonna sell your product. You know, farm, farm stores, farmer's markets, online, freezer sales, whole animals, wholesale. 
those are all options, and matching your production to your marketing. So if you've got five acres, you're going to do grass-fed beef. Your pro capacity is probably going to be a couple of steers a year at best. So this probably doesn't make much sense to jump into the wholesale market and try to supply parties with ground beef. Um, one thing about it is whenever you're direct marketing, customers want transparency. And you better believe that other farmers around you are going to hold you to it. I've seen a lot of people come and go from at the farmer's market. They get in there, they say, oh, we did this. We raised all these when they're buying them animals at the sale barn and everywhere else and and you know word spreads quickly whenever you're shortcutting things and and they will let you know because people put a lot of work in it to do it right and, and sell it um the key to the marketing the successful successfully marketing meats is you got to sell the whole animal um if you're if you're sorry learning to drive here um if you're selling it you know, the animal, it's easy to sell the steaks, but you know, you've got to be able to market and sell that 300 pounds of hamburger and other off cuts that come along with the 50 pounds of steak um, in order to be profitable. Because if you're sitting on five, 10, 15, 20, 30 pounds of meat from every animal that you can't move, a hamburger or such, it's eventually going to catch up with you. Uh, and that affects your profitability. I had done a, some simple math one time. And I think for every 50 cents price change in hamburger, so if you went up on your price 50 cents, is equivalent of going up about $4 on your steak prices per pound um, because of the greater volume of hamburger that you've produced compared to steaks. Um, think about the marketing if, and what the pros and cons are of them. Farm stores and retails are great, but they have overhead expense. You've got inventory to maintain. You've got foot traffic. You've got to figure out the staffing problem, which is a big issue for a lot of people these days, especially given the current COVID state that we're in. Uh, farmers markets are great. They're low cost, relatively low cost, out-of-pocket cost. They're good for exposure. You know, they're, you're talking about something that you're doing for about four, four hours a week of exposure. Um, so it's hard to build a really broad, uh, uh, high volume off of four hours a week. Um, you can do multiples of them. One of the things about farmer's markets is everybody I know that has graduated out of them, when they look back, they say, oh, that wasn't as cheap, as cheap a market as I thought it was. Because you got to take into account your prep time, your product that you lose, uh, moving back and forth. More times you handle that product coming in and out of the cooler more likely seals break. When seals break, customers don't want to buy it, and that's something that you and your family are eating and you're not able to sell. Uh, online sales can be a great option. A lot of people are doing that and have shifted towards that in the last month. Um, if you have the skill set to, to set up and maintain a website or you have kids or grandkids that can help you do that, that's wonderful. Shipping expenses are a burden um, when you start looking at the cost of dry ice and packing supplies. Uh, one of the most efficient, if you can do it, is, is doing freezer sales. And that's whole halves, quarters, and, and doing bulk sales. And the reason I say it's most efficient is you can sell them ahead of time. You know, I have sold this calf to Lauren Langley. She has paid me a deposit on it. It sold, can be sold months ahead of the time that it, before it's even slaughtered. It can be even be sold and have a deposit on it before you even buy the animal to finish out. I've known farmers that did that. They sold half the pigs, and whenever they got to six pigs, they stopped taking orders, and they had their money in hand before, or deposits in hand, to buy the pig and feed the pig with. Um, but once that thing's processed, it's off, it's gone, the whole animal's gone, um, and you don't have to worry about piecemealing and what to do with all that hamburger or sausage and, and the bones and such. They're all gone to the customer, and you sold them all. And generally with the freezer sales, you can offer a lower price because, you know, you're not having to put the marketing time into moving, moving that whole animal. Selling whole animals to butcher shops, restaurants, caterers, et cetera. Uh, the downside to that is there's not many places uh, that do whole animal butchery anymore. The butcher shops that are doing it generally have longstanding contracts with um, farmers for you know, that they work with on a regular basis. Um, 
restaurants, one of the biggest challenges there, especially with something like beef, is a lot of restaurants just physically do not have the space in their kitchens to bring in a quarter or a half of beef and, and cut it, much less store it in the, in the freezer. They, they like the smaller things. So whole animals can be there. It's just a challenge to find those right customers and find customers that can uh, take whole animals in the volume you need. And wholesale, if you get into wholesale, uh, a lot of people say, oh, I just want to sell some to restaurants. But <clears throat> what happens is you get into a much lower price point and it's a low margin, high volume game. So you've got to move a lot of product to, to find that profitability. And that's difficult on, I think um, they, we, we were on a, a meeting and they were talking about beef sales, wholesale beef sales, and that no man's land was somewhere between a uh, hundred and a thousand beef a year. So you could effectively direct market a hundred beef a year to, to, to a week and be profitable. <clears throat> but once you cross that line of a hundred beef a year, it was uh, not until you got closer to a thousand beef per year that you started hitting that uh, marketing to where it became uh, profitable again. So it's a giant step up. And you're also, you automatically find yourself competing with the right, with the commodity in most of your markets. The exception to that is finding your right customer. And some of these chefs are willing to pay almost full retail for processing, especially if you have a unique product and a unique story that they can add adds value to the product. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit because we're going to, we're going to run a little long if we don't. Uh, price point is what you need to look at and, and try to determine how you can compete. So you got to do a little bit of scouting ahead of time, go to farmers markets, grocers, go to websites and look at that and say, all right, well, what, what can I do to add value over that I can raise my price point that people will pay? Why will people pay me more? You know, is it a better quality product? Is it a convenience such as home delivery or online ordering? Uh, you know, is it a, a dried steak? And also think about prep package size when it comes to price point. If your um, customers tend to look at a, what is that package that you're handing me cost? Uh, this is stuff, Walmart, uh, big retailers have put billions of dollars in it and have experts that can tell you exactly what people want before people walk in the door. And a lot of it comes down to this is, you know, they know how much a, a given demographic will spend. For example, um, we sell chickens for $4 a pound. And so you take a four pound chicken, that's a $16 for a whole chicken, which was a generally tough sale at the farmer's market. People pick it up and go, oh, that's six, $16. I don't know if I want to spend $16 on chicken. Same person would turn around and buy a one pound package of boneless, skinless breast for $9.99 and not think twice because it was less than ten ten dollars for that package uh that price be aware of that price point uh, individual price plays a very big uh deciding factor on what your customers buy and it's going to vary from market to market um and also look at commodity pricing you know there's times like right now that uh commodity pricing is spiking up during, during due to demand and you need to keep an eye on that so you know uh, you shouldn't be selling bacon for less than what food line sell on it. You know, you should, you should be ahead of that. You shouldn't let, uh, let, let them be charging more than you and know that consumers don't buy on price alone. And this has been proven time and time again. Um, <coughs> they buy on a variety of things, but if you go to meat sweet and look at some of the producers on there, we have beef whole beef priced anywhere from, $3 a pound hanging weight to six or $7 a pound hanging weight and all everybody's selling uh, on that. And when you're thinking about pricing, you know, you can sell it, but can you produce it for less than you sell it? That's the profit margin. That's what you need to, for long-term sustainability. You've got to make money. And the only way you, you know, if you're making money is you've got to know what it costs. So you got to keep some records and know what your production is and what your, what kind of yields you're getting. You need to know how long, how long do those pigs take to get to market size? How many pounds of meat are you getting back out of those pigs? And how much feed did it take to get there? And how much labor did it take to get there? And, you know, losses 
have to factor into that too. So the animals die, do you lose package to broken seals? When you're calculating your cost, you know, there's three general areas that a county, county looks at. Your cost of goods, these are gonna vary with how much you raise, the number, your cost of stock, feed, processing. The more you raise, the more feed, for, feed you need, therefore the higher your feed cost. Overhead on the other hand, on the other hand, is like is a fixed cost. So rent. So if you're renting a, a farm and it costs you a thousand dollars a year, it costs you a thousand dollars a year whether you raise one pig on it or five thousand. Um, so that's a fixed cost. And then your labor, both paid and unpaid. Uh, unpaid is important to track because what happens if you get in a position that uh, you can't do it anymore and you're having to hire it? You want to make sure that you have enough uh, buffer in there that you've been paying yourself so that you can survive it and you don't immediately go to losing money just because you had to hire out. Uh, a lot of people, especially if, if y'all are with um, cow herds right now looking at selling beef, you're like, I don't know what it costs. Let's think about this. So just start with the point you do know. I'm going to use beef as an example, but you're look at what you're able to sell a calf for right now. So in the spring, um, you know, 600 pound calf was running at $1.40 a pound or $840. There's your starting place. Whether you're profitable at that or not, it's a whole different story, but it gives you a starting place if you don't have any idea what your costs are. Then you can figure out, you know, your target. You're going to shoot for two pounds a day because you want to get that animal up to 1,200 pounds. Uh, and 1,200 pounds and two pounds a day, that means you're going to have to hang on to that animal for about 10 months to get it to that point. Um, then you got to figure out what your processing is going to be when you do get to that point. Uh, $60 kill fee and $75 cut and wrap. You know, you're looking at almost $600. And so just out of pocket cost there, the cost of the calf, the cost of that uh, kill fee, you're looking at $1,415 $1, plus the cost of keeping. So that pasture cost, any feed cost you got in there, any cost of marketing. Um, you know, throwing a estimated $400 to keep that calf brings that total cost up to $1,800. So if you take that and just do a simple, um, math on it to look at it and say, all right, let's look at, a, at what our break even price is. And that's where we can start and look at our, our price point and see if we're in the ballpark. So that 1,250 pound steer yields somewhere if, and this is good yielding. So you're not going to, you probably might, won't get this if you're doing hosting steers. You know, you got to take into account your genetic potential, but a decent yielding, nicely finished, fleshed animal should give you about 400 pounds of product at a 1,200 pound steer, about a third of its life weight. If you divide that by the 18, $1,815 by that 410 pounds, or I mean by the 687 pounds, that tells you that your break-even cost should be somewhere around $4.42 a pound of the hanging weight. Oh, excuse me. Divide it by the 410, it's $4.42 per pound of the finished weight or the packaged products that you get back. Or your break-even price is somewhere around $2.65 a pound carcass weight. So if you're looking at pricing, then you can figure up, oh, I can sell uh, based on $3 carcass weight, there's $0.35 cent per pound profit on that uh, 35 cent per pound times 600 is roughly about 250 bucks, 225, 250 bucks. So you can decide, do I, is it worth all the trouble to do that? Or should I shoot for $3 and 25 cent a pound and go up some more on it? Um, but just doing a simple break even. So in, in order to double your calf price, so if you wanted to add that much value and double your price, because think of it this way, if you keep that calf for another 10 months, that's almost taking up the space of another cow, cow having a calf for those 10 months. So by doubling your space, your, your calf money, you could actually cut your cow herd in half and, and be the same there. Anyway, so if you want to double that calf price, uh, just figure that into the equation. And that brings you out about $5.50 on that finished product or $3.29 on your carcass weight. So you can see there, if you can effectively move them, uh, there's, there's a, way to add some significant value. When we talk about record keeping, um, this is an example of a hogs, uh, but 
for those of y'all that are decent with spreadsheets, this is something simple you can put together. And when you start processing, anybody that's doing this, I suggest that you write down, so keep some records. So when you take a hog in and get it uh, killed, write down what the carcass weight was, write down, you know, how many pounds of pork chops did I get back? What's my selling weight? And then I can derive a, a total value of that. And so what I can do is take a spreadsheet and effectively put all these things together and come up with that total return. So I can look at it and say that 184 pound pig gave me, if you look here at the bottoms, 141 pounds of packaged product, which I was able to sell for $984.25. You now know where your, your, your finished product, what did you actually get out of that pig? And what happens is, over the years, it takes a little while to do it, but over the years, you start looking at it, and when your pigs come back and you go, I usually get 14 pounds of pork chops out of mine, but for some reason, I only got nine this time. Let me look and see what I did different. Did I, if it's happened before, you go to a processor, you pick up your stuff, you get home, and you're like, wait a minute, this is off by 20 pounds or 40 pounds. Call them up, and they're like, oh, yeah, you had a tray of meat back here that was on somebody else's cart you know, uh, we'll, we'll have it for you next time. But that would, if you didn't keep the records, you wouldn't have any idea that you'd missed out on that. Um, most importantly is you're now the salesman. If you're going to get into direct marketing, you've got to learn about the cuts, go to the, go and see it hanging, see what your animal actually looks like. See when you're in there, most of, most of the processors, you know, with some, um, we'll let you make appointments, come in, see your animal get cut, come in and see it in the cooler. When you're walking around the cooler, look at what's around it. Look at the, what does everybody else's cow look like that's hanging next to it? Is yours little and shrimpy? Is yours overly fat and huge? You know, make a comparison. See what, how, it, how it looks. Inventory your packages. Know what your yields are. You know, know what, have an idea of what size uh, packs of your pork chops are. So you know it off the top of your head. You don't have to go in the cooler every time you need somebody to ask you a question. Most importantly, when it comes to marketing, learn to cook everything. If you sell it, try it, cook it. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, can, a complex recipe, but have a recipe in the back of your head for anything and everything you sell. Um, was at a farmer's market one time. A neighbor was selling uncured bacon, which is sliced pork belly. Woman walked up and says, do you have bacon? He says, yes. And he lays a pack of that on there. She's like, oh, well, there's uncured there's no salt there's no smoke how do you do it he said i don't know ma'am i just sell it that's no way to sell your product you need to have a quick recipe that says oh it's really great it's just like bacon but it's not salt no salt or smoke so salt it good fry it like you would bacon and add some seasoning if you want or use it for flavoring you know just something really simple is all you've got to know but it makes a world of difference in your customer um your customers trust in you Encourage feedback from your customers. Uh, nine, 99 times out of 100, they're probably not going to tell you if something didn't taste good. Your good customers will. Your good customers will give you feedback when they do. I was, eat it. Give them, give them, a, give them something else and, and replace it. They come back and they say, you know, these pork chops were tough. I, I don't know what it is about it. And they're there every week. Give them a pack of pork chops and say, here, sorry for the inconvenience. They do it every week. Tell them to go away. You're not giving them free pork chops every week. But, you know, the ones that give you honest feedback will appreciate it. Most of the time, they don't even expect it. But if you can't guarantee that's quality, don't even. If you, something doesn't look right and you wouldn't feed it your family, tr sure as hell don't try to sell it, please. Um, another example of just knowing what you've got, looking at it, looking at the quality of the meat, look at it, compare to your neighbors. Buy, when you're doing that scouting, buy pork chops, buy steaks from other people. Uh, at farmer's market so you have an idea what you're up against or at least go try to peek in their cooler and, and see what their pricing is and what their their product actually looks like this is um <coughs> let's see we are we're crowding time uh so i'll go through this real quick this is our part of our project talking about selling the whole whole animal as we worked with cornell university who has developed a few tools one of them being this meat and price and yield calculator. Um, if you come through it, if you go to the, if you do a Google search for Cornell meat price and yield calculator, it will pull up. 
you can go in, this is a really handy tool, um, you can put in your cost, uh, much like the simulation we did. This is much more in depth. It will take it as far as you want to go, pretty much. Um, you put in your production cost, you put in how much it costs to haul an animal to the, to the processor. Are you hauling one animal? Are you hauling five animals? It calculates that cost of, of delivery. It pick, you can put in cost of bringing that product back. And at the end, it will give you a break even price. Uh, you can put in profit goals. So you can put in that I would like to make 20% profit or I would like to make a $200 per head profit. And it will tell you whether you're meeting those goals or exceeding those goals or where you need to be to do that. This is a really handy tool. If you're serious about getting in the meat, I, I really suggest you get on there and play with this and, and get familiar with it. And it will help you think through the cost associated in producing also. Um, once again, I said, you know, the, the best way that you can sell is, uh, to move that whole animal and freezer beef being, or freezer sales being one of the, um, best ways to do that, that whole animal. This is a project we just launched, Meat Sweet, the price calculator included in that was developed by Cornell about 10 years ago, uh, to fill a need to connect farmers to urban customers and sell them meat in bulk which allowed them to be more profitable, have less sales transactions to move an animal, and allowed them to sell animal at a lower cost. And you know, consumers could buy an animal and have for have five or six dollars a pound in it versus, you know, uh, a significant savings over maybe buying it one piece at a time at the farmer's market. Um, so we have adopted this and we've just launched it for North Carolina. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this meat sweet site, and if you go, uh, you can put your your farm on here for. I'm going to change what I'm sharing here. We'll go to meat sweet. So this is a free service. Uh, this is brought to you via a USDA beginning uh, farmer rancher grant that we got for North Carolina. Uh, Meat Suite allows consumers to connect directly with farms that are selling meat in bulk. So hey, Lee. Yes. Sorry, I had to interrupt you. We are seeing your PowerPoint still. Okay. So I think then, you got to minimize it and then pull the other no, one back up. Let me do that. Let me stop share and reshare. So can y'all see Meat Suite now? Yes. Okay. So as consumers can come on here, they can search for within a radius of their, uh, their zip code for a variety of products. Uh, you as a farm can come on here. You can add your farm um, and they can even peruse the farms. You're welcome to come here and um, look and do some price comparison. Uh, there's, it's available in North Carolina and New York. North Carolina just launched. We, we, we were planning on launching as consumers in midsummer, but amid the COVID stuff and the increase, all of a sudden we had an increase in demand. Uh, we launched it early about two weeks ago and we currently have uh, 81 farms on here in North Carolina. And since uh, we launched this thing in March, we've had over 18,000 visits um, to the website. So it has been an extremely popular place to have a farm listed. So if you are doing the, if you sell uh, meat, this is a, a great place to be listed. And there's a lot of press going out. It's really hot right now. Um, and if you go, we'll pull up, we'll pick on Jamie Brown, Brown Farm here in Mount Ola. Uh, you can see, you get a picture, you can post a pretty picture of your farm. It has a, a Google map to find you. It has your contact information. You can add tags like pasture raised, organic. Um, you do a description and then you list a product. And so here we have whole finished steers. If you buy a whole steer, it's $4.35 a pound. Uh, hanging weight, which includes processing. And that's one of the requirements of the site is that you include processing in it. And if you need help with figuring out what that would be, you know, you're, we'll be glad to help you with it. Um, one of the other things to think about I'll pick on these guys right here um, is 
looking at it from the standpoint of uh, this is our farm, by the way. Um, instead of a, a whole animals, think about a beef. So right now, a purchase of a whole beef may be two or three thousand dollars. That's a lot of money for uh, a family to come up with, even though it's a, a savings over individual cuts. That's just a, a, a large amount of money. And so one thing you might want to do, and I've worked with a lot of consumers to do, is put together boxes. Um, so like we do a, a pork box that represents, you know, somewhere around a fifth or a sixth or an eighth of a, a pig, you know, a 30 pound box. And it contains a variety of cuts. So it's not like a half a pig, it's just a scaled down version. And $200 is a lot easier for somebody to come up with versus if they bought that whole pig, A, they wouldn't get the same variety I can offer them in a box like this of sausages. And they would have to come up with, you know, $1,200 for that same pig. So this makes it much more appealing when you start putting together these bulk boxes that can represent a smaller portion or like a 10, 10 pound hamburger pack. We got a lot of those on there that people, you knock 50 cent a pound off of it and they buy 10 pounds at a time. You've moved that much more. You can put things in there that you want to move. Uh, but be, be aware of that price point thing too when you're moving in bulk and think of some creative ways. And we'll be having, the, we're working with Matt LaRue who is the developer of Meat Suite. And so we're actually in the process of setting these together and we'll have them uh, sent out on our NC Choices website and through mail on list um, that y'all found out about this. But we're going to do some uh, pricing strategy workshops coming up probably in May around uh, developing things like this. So talk about bulk sales and developing pricing strategies that reach more consumers. But this is a really good tool. Go on there, check it out. Look at some of the farms. Uh, if you're on there, please join up. If you have any issues or any questions about it, you can contact me and let's see. And I'll scroll to the bottom there and there's my email. I also put it in the chat box at the beginning. Uh, so if you have any issues, feel pr free to shoot me an email uh, or have any questions. So do we have any, speaking of questions, do we have any questions? Yes, so there are um, a couple of like discussion questions in here. Um, so Caroline said, we have beef cattle currently. We ban them to steer. What I've read is to raise 18 to 21 months, lock up for the last 90 days and feed high protein forage and feed. What else should be considered or is anything wrong with what we have read? Uh, there's nothing wrong with what you've read. Uh, you know, and depending on, like I said, depends on your breed. I've had grass-fed beef with the right genetics that we've had finish out and, and grade out really nicely at 15 months old. I've had others that took 27, 28 months to get there. You know, a lot of it depends on the genetics. It depends on what kind of feed you're putting into them. Um, you know, we get that a lot about the locking, locking them up for the last 90 days. Uh, I would say that's not not necessarily you know what the majority of producers do most most producers that i worked with overall do a pasture race and fed scenario so they feed grain the animals are on pasture the whole time with fit, either grass underfoot that they're eating or they're on hay and they're also you know there's a feed bunk out there you're going out and feeding them once or twice a day it's not a heavy grain diet um but you know, it's not like a feedlot where you're pushing them for optimal performance and have a, a real dialed in recipe. But you know, the depending on the pasture, if you've got really good pasture, take advantage of it. Those those animals will will do fine on it without being locked up. If you've yeah. got a lot of wild onions, then you might want to lock them up and feed them hay. <laughs> And I will right. second that. Um, we finish a steer every year for our family and that steer is always on pasture. He's supplemented on and off and then he's supplemented more towards the end, you know, like anywhere from 30 to 60 days and it's minimal feed, you know, five to 10 pounds or so a day or every other day. So it's flexible. And I think you just like anything else, you've got to play with it to see how it works for your farm and your situation. And, and I'll mention one other thing is, you know, I, I didn't delve into alternative feeds a whole lot. 
but it's really important that whatever you're feeding, you're, you're feeding a good quality. Um, you know, a lot of people jumped on, you know, we live in it, we live right down the road from a brewery. They're giving us brewer's grains to feed, uh, bringing it back and trying to, to grow hogs off of brewer's grain. I've tried that. It, it is not a good feed. Brewer's grain makes a great feed for cattle, for feeding cattle. There's a, because of their stomach structure, cattle are able to utilize it a lot better than pigs. Um, but a lot of times you really got to look at these free feeds because these free feeds are not free whenever you start figuring in wear and tear and time spent going after them and everything. And you've got to weigh that against the cost comparison of just say running down and getting a, or putting in an order and getting a ton of feed, putting a grain bin or a wagon for you. Yeah. And I will say it's really important that anytime you're feeding some type of byproduct um, that's not a complete feed with a label that you have it tested. You know, NCDA has a farm feed testing service. Um, they'll test anything that's not commercial feed and it's $10 a sample. So if you are getting brewer's grains, you need to know what's in it. Um, it's a lot of water. <laughs> so or if it's wet brewer's grains. Um, so yeah, I second all of that. Um, Caroline had another question. Uh, she said, we have Angus cows. What is the fat versus lean meat breakdown? Good marbling question mark. He mentioned breed specifics earlier. Um, the, so lean to fat mm -hmm. is, um, basically what, you, what you want. Now, if you know, YouTube university can be wonderful for some for being exposed to things. If you can learn to take things with a grain of salt. Um, when it comes to fat, there's a lot of videos uh, put out by extension across the country about looking at cattle and signs of what, when those cattle, the physical signs of what, what makes uh, finished cattle. Um, and so by doing some research and, and looking at those, you'll put yourself in the best position if you, have some idea of what you're looking at cattle wise. You know, if you're looking at a cow and it looks like this across the back, chances are it's not done and ready to do unless it's a whole thing. But you know, you're, you know how to, to judge an animal uh, to where their fat, fat composition on the outside should relate to a good quality marbling. It's not always the case. A lot of it boils down to genetics. Some of it can boil down to feed programs, but this is where keeping records about weights and, and what kind of product you get back and all and going and seeing that stuff hanging. Um, just as a hard part, you really need to, to put some time and effort into learning about finishing. I would say 99, 95% of the people that, that I know that are doing this, you know, a lot of them just, you, you know, they, they kind of know a, a when they're there, but as far as really having a plan and an eye for a finished animal, it, it just, it's a, it's something that you can develop, but only develop by looking at it. And if that makes sense, you know, and, and seeing it, and the more you see it, whether it's on YouTube, through these extension, um, extension videos, or whether it's live cattle and knowing what your cattle do and keeping those records, um, that's the only way you develop it is the more you see, the, the better you get at it. Yeah, and I will say for cattle, when they start to smooth over, that's a really good indicator that they're approaching finishing. Um, and so again, looking at pictures, you're going to looking at live cattle that are in that finishing phase will help you develop an eye for it. And for marbling, the best way to figure all that out is definitely from a genetic standpoint and doing excellent bull selection um and and knowing what what your cow herd is made of um but a lot of that is genetics but definitely some of it is environment and feeding and that sort of thing as well so and, um, and this is this is a good good place I, i'll put a plug in for no matter where you're at in the country uh develop a working relationship with your livestock agent uh livestock agents are a great tool you know they're the ones that can you can holler at them and say, you know, I think I've got some cows ready or getting ready. Would you mind stopping by here and, and looking at them and let's, let's talk, talk about it. Or they can put you in touch with 
opportunities to get in front of those cattle and see what other people are doing so that you can develop it out. So reach out to your local livestock agent in your county or area. Okay, so Claire says, is there still a poultry processing mobile unit for rent? And the answer should be yes, right, Lee? Um, that, they can go on your website. There are, we have, that's, that's included in the poultry processing list. We're actually in the process of, hopefully by this summer, we'll have everything mapped out to where when you pull it up, the pasture poultry processing resources, uh, you'll see a state of North Carolina with little dots for, one color dot for uh, mobile units for rent and other dots for um, farmers that will do processing for you. Uh, so we're in the process of working to make that a lot more user friendly. But yeah, they're out there and a list should be at ncchoices.com. Yeah, and Claire, I'm pretty certain you're in Chatham County. And so there's several right around in our area for rent. Um, so I'll be sure to give everybody links to all the stuff we're talking about in the email. Um, so Ronald asks, what do I do with rabbits to sell? List them on Meat Suite. <laughs> <laughs> rabbits are, are, are the redheaded stepchild of children of red meat. Um, up until 2008, uh, rabbits loosely fell under the poultry exemption. Um, and you were allowed to do rabbits at the time that poultry exemption got adopted. Uh, some things changed up. FDA, instead of USDA has jurisdiction over red meat, FDA, anything that's not specifically listed as red meat falls to FDA and not USDA. FDA uh, has a, the Food and Drug Administration has a totally different viewpoint on food safety and, and red meat. You can apply and you can do your own on-farm processing. You have to reach out to FDA I still recommend that you contact Meat and Poultry Inspection Division of North Carolina Department of Ag and tell them who do you need to talk to at FDA. Um, and FDA will permit you to process on the farm. Uh, th as far as there's nowhere in North Carolina, um, the poultry plants had generally offered rabbit processing as part of their services, but with them being inspected poultry plants being gone. That is not a service that I know of anywhere in North Carolina will process rabbits for you. Okay, so Andrew asked, what is a typical profit margin on grass-fed direct market beef? Um, it just varies so, so widely. Um, you know, it depends on, it, a lot of it just depends on what do you, what is your goals to begin with? Like I said, when you go to meat suite, you'll, you'll see that it, if you go through the prices, it ranges from $3 to $6 a pound hanging weight. And it does, it's not based on whether somebody has three cows or 300 cows. It's just, that's what it is. Um, I know people that are, I was talking to one neighbor the other day that's tickled to death to sell his, fat finished steers hauled to the processor and he charges a dollar 30 a pound for them. So he's getting a thousand pounds. He's getting $1,300. Um, if you took that and put it on the low end, um, $3 a pound hanging weight at six, uh, 600, 700 pound, um, uh, carcass weight, you're looking at $2,000. That's a significant amount of money left on the table, but he's happy with it. You know, you, you can't, you can't say there's there's a target there. You need to figure out what your goal is. Is it to make vacation money? Do you want to make enough every year that you can rent a house at the beach and take your kids to the beach? Or do you want to make a living at it? Because those are two very different goals and two very different pricing strategies. Absolutely. Okay, so last question from Ronald is, how much can you sell without meat handler's license? Without one? Yep, he said without okay. one. So you, you, you can sell it. You can sell as much as you want without a meat handler's license. That it's just, you have to have that meat handler's license. If you pick that package product up and assume possession of it at any point between the processor and the end consumer, you must have a meat handler's license. So if I pick it up and I haul it to your house, 
and sell it to you, you've got to have it. If I sell you a cow and you pay me, and even if you pay me and I pay the processor and you pick it up from the processor, you do not need a meat handler's license. Meat handler is only for handling meat post-processing. So if you want to stay totally off the grid, just sell them the animal and have them pick it up at the processor. All right. Well, that's the end of our questions. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And like I said, this recording will be available and I'll be sending an email with some resources, websites, and an evaluation. So thank you so much. Have a good night.